Okay. Okay. Yes. So sorry. We'll we'll get started now. Um, so yeah, welcome back to the second lecture. Um, just to remind everyone who's joining online, we have the question and answer feature on the Zoom call. So if you have a question during the talk, um, please type the question into that so that the moderators can either read your question or if it's a longer thing, um, maybe they'll have you on mute. Um, and of course, for longer discussions, we'll again have time at the end of the, the lecture to have longer questions or extended discussion. Um, yeah, and then we'll be, the first video from the first lecture is posted. So if you haven't seen that and need to catch up, it's on the YouTube link that Ted emailed out. And um, we'll try to get this uploaded as quickly as possible for the second lecture afterwards. Okay, yeah, okay, so we can get started. Um, so yeah, I wanted to finish up our discussion of the, the infinite tensor products from Neumann algebras that we were considering from last time. Um, and I just wanted to remind people, I forgot to mention this reference. This is this uh, Witten review article that um, goes over a lot of the, the von Neumann algebra background. So feel free to, to look at that um, if you want more info on some of this stuff. Um, okay, so if you remember last time, what we did is we took a construction of these uh, qubits. So we took pairs of entangled qubits. We were looking at the two by two matrix algebras so that were acting on it. And we took this vacuum state that involved an infinite tensor product of these maximally entangled pairs of qubits. And we built up this von Neumann algebra um, from you know constructing a Hilbert space and closing it. Um, and this, just to remind you, this was this uh, type two one von Neumann algebra was the result here. So I just wanted to briefly um, go over a slight modification of this construction um, that gives you uh, the other types of von Neumann algebras, in particular type three von Neumann algebras. And the idea is you, instead of taking this maximally entangled uh, reference state for every site, um, we'll take one of these, uh, we'll take a state that is entangled, but it's sub-maximal entangled, and uh, sub-maximal entanglement. So this second entanglement eigenvalue is less than, sorry, this lambda is between zero and one. So it's not a proportional to the identity anymore. Okay, and so then we'll just proceed as before, where we start with a vector that's just an infinite tensor product of this reference matrix. And then you construct the Hilbert space by only changing finitely many factors in that tensor product. And then you go ahead and complete this Hilbert space um, using the inner product there. And this results basically in something that looks different from this, this Hilbert space um, that you got by using the maximally entangled qubit, essentially because the limits that you add in this procedure are, are different. So similarly, you'll have the same algebra acting on this infinite tensor product Hilbert space. Your starting point again is you have elements acting on the left that are identity in all but finitely many positions. So you have identity going out to infinity there, and you just start by changing finitely many. Um, and the point is when because the Hilbert space closure looks different from this perspective. Um, when you complete the algebra in the weak topology uh, defined by this Hilbert space, the new Hilbert space with this sub-maximal entanglement, um, you end up with a different von Neumann algebra at the end of the day. Um, so what is this? This von Neumann algebra is actually an example of one of these type three von Neumann algebras. In this, in this case, you have this this lambda here corresponds rough basically to this number here. So for every value of lambda between zero and one, not including the limits, you get a type three von Neumann algebra and they're all not isomorphic to each other. So these are known as the powers factors. And again, they're hyperfinite because we realize this as a limit of these finite dimensional sub algebras. Okay, so the reason for going over this construction is just to emphasize a few points. Um, the starting point for both, for all of these, the construction of all of the algebras, so the type two one, as well as the type three lambda, was the same sort of underlying algebra that just consisted of finitely many operators acting on the, on the, the left. 
And it's just because the vacuum that we chose was different, and that's what resulted in different von Neumann algebras when we took the completion. So that's a, a theme that can come up that the, the choice of the, the state that the underlying algebra is acting on can give you different results at the end of the day. Yeah. Yes. Can we go from two to three and back by changing the value of that? They're different, right? Type two and three are the, allocated bigger. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, well, yeah, completely, yeah. Yeah. Not so, some more big, yeah. But as you've written down there, lambda, if we make it into one, that you, it doesn't come close to. So if you, if you set it equal to one, yeah. you get this type two one that we constructed last time. Right. So yes. So my question is that if epsilon is, you know, lambda is epsilon close to one, there is a big divide between the two in terms of type two versus type three. Um, yeah. Well, I guess the yeah the the qualitative difference is you when lambda actually equals one, you get this trace on the algebra, and then that's yeah for any lambda, you know, close but less than one, you don't have that. Yeah, I don't know if the people have thought much about what that limiting is, but it's kind of like this limit of these algebras as lambda goes to one. Looks, it right? looks like the type two one, just from this perspective. Yeah. Um, okay, another important thing to point out on this, and this is related to the type three property, is that these reference uh, states here are no longer proportional to the identity, whereas they were, so this, this is not the same as this, they were proportional to the identity in the, the maximally entangled one. And what, what we, that implies is that we used that this vacuum state in the type two one case was proportional to this product of identities to construct a, a trace on the algebra. We said, if you take the expectation value in the vacuum state, um, that state is tracial. So the fact that, so what this means is that if you take the expectation value in this vacuum state, it's not gonna be tracial. So, you know. <laughs> The K back A B A back is not going to equal A back A lambda B A. Somehow we just lost U S of A. Okay. Are there sorry, we're just checking uh Possible technical difficulties. Okay, yeah, maybe write in the comments if there's any issues viewing online, um, but we'll keep going. Oh, okay. oh yeah. 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 You don't have this tracial property anymore. And the fact that it's type three, you can show that there is no tracial state on this algebra that's, you know, satisfies these other conditions that we talked about. And so that's this type three property. Um, this is a nice model too, because the choice of vacuum state, it, it shares something that we're kind of familiar with from quantum field theory, is that you see that the vacuum is highly entangled, but when you have this lambda, since it's not maximal, you know, the, these reference states are not proportional to the identity, then the vacuum is not maximally entangled, but it was in the type two one case. Um, an important point to point out here that's also a feature that happens in quantum field theory is that there's no sense that this Hilbert space that we construct here, um, H lambda or also the HB uh, in the type two one case, there's no sense in which it factorizes into all the qubits on the left and all the qubits on the right. And so that's an important feature as well in quantum field theory is that the, the formal tensor factorization that people often employ is again a formal procedure. It leads to certain UV divergences. And you can kind of see this here is the reason it's not factorizing is because there's, you know, we've taken an infinite sequence of qubits that are all, you know, either maximally entangled or all have some amount of entanglement. So all of the states in this Hilbert space are essentially too entangled to make sense of a, a tensor factorization when you complete to this these uh, these Hilbert spaces here. 
Okay, and then the last point that's worth mentioning is that you can now do one more layer of complexity to this construction, where now you choose a vacuum state where you change the value of lambda um, at every site as you go there. So you have a reference state where there's a different value of lambda at every point. Um, and depending on how you pick the pattern of the entanglements or the pattern of the different lambdas, you can end up with different results. But if the lambdas that you pick are just generic in a certain sense, so they would have at least two limit points that are sort of not rational multiples of each other, um, that's a situation where you can get this type three one. So again, this one here has nothing to do with the limit as lambda goes to one here. It's just a different number. Um, <laughs> But this type three one is important because there's several arguments that those are the, the algebras that show up in quantum field theory. Okay, and uh, just to mention that this construction with the qubits and picking lambdas, it goes back to Iraqi and Woods, so. Right, I mean, if I yes. may just uh, follow up a little bit. But I worry about, the, no, worry about two and three, mm -hmm. because I remember in the chart you gave mm -hmm. in the last lecture, Three is quantum field theory. Yeah. Whereas two becomes quantum or semi classical quantum gravity. Right. That's, yeah. The goal is to discuss so that. So it hinges on the lambda less than one or equals to one. It, 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 well, it's, okay. It's, the models in quantum field theory, um, you know, they, they in principle map onto some construction like this, but it's not like there's a canonical isomorphism from. The quantum fields to the qubits. You could just say, okay, there is in principle you could set it up like this. Um, so that's the first thing is that there's not literally a qubit, but you know it's the picture suggestive, I guess. Um, right. But then what was the second question? So well, it, it, it's the first question, the same question. Same question. But yeah. then I'm looking at the relation between act two and three just from this lambda value. Mm -hmm. One is less than one; the other is equal to one. Let's say, right? Yeah, and so in quantum field theory, it's sort of uh, random, so kind of chaotic lambda. Uh, but how do I see quantum field theory so in relation to semi quantum uh, gravity? Um, so in a we'll, we might have to, we might be just part of the, the goal is to maybe explain how that comes about. So it's not going to come about from this kind of construction. It's related to these cross products constructions, but we have to develop a bit more so to see you. that. So, so that'll be, I'll have to defer that one until the later part. Thanks yeah. For yeah. <laughs> um, hey, Anthony, we have two questions from the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, the first one is the uh, Krishna Jalan was wondering about the uh, why lambda is restricted to be between zero and one. In particular, he was wondering if it was related to some convergence property. Oh, okay, no, it's just that you want these to be good density matrices. So here you, if you don't, okay, you want to, you want them to be positive and if it's bigger than one because of this normalization, you'll just, fit, you'll switch which one's bigger than the other. So, um, so yeah, they're trace ones, density matrices or when you square this. Yeah. Uh, and the second question is about the notation on the right-hand side of the board. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 someone in the chat is wondering why there are no MIs, but only K lambdas on the right-hand side. Uh, I was just writing the, the vacuum state. So this is the, the reference state, the, the starting vacuum state, and then all of the other states in the Hilbert space you build up by changing one or more of those. Okay. Okay, so that's the what that's what we I wanted to say about the cubic constructions, just to give you a sense of you, you should think of this as a good model of the entanglement structure that these other algebras are describing. And so the yeah, it should give you some intuition for um for entanglements, uh, or why these algebras aren't factorized. <laughs> Okay, so at this point, we're going to move on to a separate topic that's important for the later developments. And this is this Tamita Takasaki theory. <clears throat> so this ends up being a kind of a central tool 
for analyzing these uh, type two and type three algebras. Um, and it provides you certain things to work with um, that doesn't rely on the tensor factorization that you normally empl employ if you were doing standard quantum information. Um, and it doesn't rely actually on density matrices either. So this is something that you can use to analyze uh, the structure of type three algebras as well as type two. Okay, so how does this work? Um, so we're we're going to start with some vector state. So yeah, maybe just to say what we're we're just going to have a von Neumann algebra. A is a von Neumann algebra, um, and we're going to be considering sort of the properties of some state that uh, in the Hilbert space that that algebra is acting on. Um, this state is required to be to have two technical requirements that we call it cyclic and separating. So cyclic, this is the first time we encountered this word. Um, cyclic for the algebra A means that if you look at states that you obtain by acting on this vector with uh, elements of A, um, it means that the, the all the full set of states that you get by doing this for all different values of A um, is dense in the full Hilbert space. So you can kind of generate the whole Hilbert space just by acting on this initial vector here. The second point is that we want it to be separating. And that means A acting on psi does not equal zero unless A itself is zero. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and so these properties in finite dimensions um, they just mean that this state here is sufficiently entangled between the two algebras. So it's really what it means is if you were in finite dimensions, you would want the density matrix to be full rank and you want the density matrix for the, the complement to be full rank. So that's what these two conditions mean in um, in finite dimension. So you, it just means that this state is has a sufficient amount of entanglement to represent the algebra by acting on it like this. Okay, <clears throat> okay. and so. What you do now is you're going to define an operator. You're going to use the fact that neither of these things are, are zero and they're kind of dense to define what's known as a Tamita operator. <clears throat> by the following relation. So we take S, this is the Tamita operator acting on A psi. And it's an operator when acting on this state just implements this dagger operation from the algebra. It's a dagger acting on psi. Okay, so this definition does make use of these two properties. Essentially, because it's cyclic, that means um, this is going to define S on sort of a basis of states, a dense set of states in the algebra. And because none of these are killing the vector here, there's no ambiguity in the definition that might come from some operators where A acting on psi is non-zero, but A dagger acting on psi is zero. So that's why you're using cyclic and separating here. Okay, so one important thing about these relations is that S psi is anti-linear. So it makes it a little annoying sometimes to work with because you have to think about what that means. But again, anti-linear means that S psi can take C to be a complex number acting on any state. Um, the complex numbers get conjugated when, you, when they pass through the anti-linear operator acting on phi. Okay, so that's just something you have to keep in mind that there's a few complex conjugations that can happen. Um, Anthony, could you reiterate yeah. what, how did you use um, separating? I didn't really see the logic that you said. What would be the problem if the right hand side was zero? Um, the real problem is if the left hand yeah. side is zero. A, a, oh, a, a is zero, and this is not zero. zero. Yeah. A dagger. Okay, yeah, I said it in the wrong way. 
you'd have a linear operator acting on zero, giving something non-zero, that would be mm -hmm. possible. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so just to clarify, yeah, it's if, if this was zero and this was non-zero, this equation would be confusing <laughs> and not make sense as a linear equation. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, and uh, another point is just to mention that this operator is unbounded in general. Um, I think the idea is you can get, you can find A to make it very close to, um, what is it, to make it very close to an annihilation operator, whereas A would be like, A dagger would be like a creation operator. And using that, you can get your, you can construct states where this doesn't have a bound on it. Um, so that's just important to keep in mind that when you're trying to be careful about proving things, in this uh, theory, you actually have to work with, be careful about domains and things for unbounded operators in the infinite dimensional case. Okay, and so this, this operator here is used to construct the main operator to use in Tomita Takasaki theory. So what you do is you do a polar decomposition of S. So we write S psi is equal to j psi delta psi to the one half, where j is anti-unitary. And delta psi is positive. So it's a positive operator. <laughs> and so what this means is you should think of delta is just the modulus of the S operator. So you can write S dagger S is equal to delta psi. I also think, I'm not sure, but I think that's where the terminology for these operators come from. Um, so this is called the modular operator, and I think it just comes from the, the sense in which it's the modulus of this S operator. Um, okay, so delta psi, just to write that, is called the modular operator, just right, op, and J psi is called the modular conjugation. <clears throat> um, okay, so just to give you to maybe make it a little more precise what these operators are. Um, the modular operator itself is very closely related to density matrices. So generally you can write this equation where delta psi is equal to the density matrix for the algebra here times the density matrix, uh, let me, for the commutant algebra inverse. So if you actually had a factorized Hilbert space, you would find that this modular operator is just the product of the two density matrices with one of them being the inverse here. So this equation, um, this is actually true for a one and two algebras, and it's why these algebras have density matrices. Um, and this is sort of not, this is definitely, this is not true. <laughs> For type three. So this is the statement. If you try to factorize the modular operator like this in a type three case, like in quantum field theory, that's where you run into kind of singular operators. Um, on the other hand, often when you're doing uh, computations in Tomita Takasaki theory or in quantum field theory, you're trying to check if something you know is in your algebra or not it's often useful to pretend that the operator does factorize and if you come up with some something sensible at the end of the day you can usually use that to construct the correct proof of what you were trying to show um, without assuming the factorization so it's a it's a very useful mnemonic to keep in mind that if as long as this is in your final answer you should feel free to do this type of factorization okay so then, because this is a, well, this is a positive operator, and so you can define its log 
here. So it's just the exponential of some Hamiltonian. And so H psi here, um, right, minus log delta psi is called the modular Hamiltonian. <clears throat> um, yeah, if you're familiar with modular Hamiltonians and entanglement theory, sometimes these are defined as just the one-sided uh, operator. So if we pretend to do this factorization again, um, you can formally, in quotation marks, might write this as minus log rho psi plus log rho psi prime. And so oftentimes people will refer to just the one-sided guy as the modular Hamiltonian, but so we'll always refer to that as the two-sided thing that also involves the, the log of the complementary density matrix. <clears throat> Sorry, I think I missed a technical thing. Are you saying the log of delta always exists? It's always meaningful? Uh, yeah, this is a positive operator. So the, the, the log is good. It's uh, just each side will have spectrum, the full real line. <clears throat> so you kind of glossed over the fact that you could do the polar decomposition. Oh, yeah. Sorry. OK, maybe I should emphasize. Is that polar decomposition is something you could do for these operators. And it's uh, it's important because it's unique. So the, the anti-unitary part and the positive part is a unique decomposition. Um, so I'm familiar with that with finite dimensions. I'm just a little bit. Is there anything tricky about it being true for um, I guess you have to think about it for unbounded. I mean, that's why it took to, to me in Takasaki uh, two years to get all the three. Yeah, so you have to, <laughs> you're you're right. It's technically complicated, but there's yeah, there are technical things where you you worry about this operator being unbounded but closed, and then you go from there to to show things. So it's a nice a nice unbounded operator in some sense. But yeah, um, yeah. But basically, yeah, a lot of the work in the theory was dealing with those subtleties, I guess. Um, okay. So there's a few important points that are basically the central theorems of Tamita Takasaki theory um, that we are going to have in mind. Kind of the, the hard part, I think, to show in the whole theory is that this Hamiltonian here actually generates a symmetry of the algebra. So this is called the modular automorphism. Where you essentially you want to flow, do time evolution with respect to this Hamiltonian. And so you can define your operator A sub S e to the as e to the i s h psi a e to the minus i s h psi and the important point is that this always remains in your algebra um so in that sense it defines a symmetry because you can also you know a b sub s will equal a s b sub s which is um that's obvious from the definition but it also it's just that these remain in the algebra and that's important here. Um, but, and again, this is basically obvious that you can write the operator, the modular operator like this, but it's true also in the type three case in quantum field theory that this remains in the algebra. So that's one reason it's very useful. The other part of the theory is this modular conjugation um, operator sends an operator in your algebra um, to an operator in the commutant. So this is an element of A prime. So this will always commute with all of A. Um, and we'll see this hopefully in a bit, but um, you kind of, in quantum field theory, this J psi is, is like um, the CPT operator. In some cases, it literally is the CPT operator. Um, and so this is something that takes something you know, in one region of space time and it kind of maps it to the commutant region in space time. So we'll discuss that more, but that's just to keep that in mind. <clears throat> okay, the other very useful thing is that not only is this modular automorphism group a symmetry, 
Um, it sort of reflects that your correlation, there, it satisfies a condition that says your correlation functions are essentially, well, the states that you're in are essentially thermal with respect to this um, Hamiltonian. So what does that mean is the way you characterize thermality of correlation functions in this setup is from the KMS condition. And what it says is that if you take a correlation function of A flowed by a certain amount of modular time with B, this is related to the same correlation function with the operators reversed and this modular time analytically continued to imaginary values. Um, okay, so this is the sort of continuum way of characterizing a thermal correlation function with respect to um, a Hamiltonian. Um, the precise statement is that you have to write down this correlation function as an analytic function of S, and then you show that it can be analytically continued in such a way that this relation holds on the correlation function. Um, this condition is also related to a useful condition for, you know, in practice, it helps you use these modular operators is that you can think of them as the thing you need to insert to reverse the order of operators in a correlation function. So it's this relation is a bit, can also, it leads to this following relation, which is also very useful. If you have the operators in one order um, inside of a correlation function like this, it's equal to the same correlation function with the modular operator inserted. Uh, would you say that again? You're saying this is the same condition? Yeah, so the way you see that is that, um, yeah, let me, I should say this as well. Part of the, the Tomita Takasaki theory is the way that these operators act on the state side. So this acts on the state side by just fixing it. So the state side is an eigen vector of this operator, and J also fixes the state. Okay, so if you do this, and then you plug it into an equation like this, you're going to get um, this factor of I will drop out when it gets there, and then you'll get a, the delta coming in on this side if you plug in coming from the conjugation there. And so that's how it's related to that. Uh, that's a question from Zoom. <clears throat> uh, so yep. I was wondering um, why it is that the uh, modular flow is not taking the A operator outside of the algebra? Uh, that's the theorem. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, an, intuition for it? an intuition. I mean, my intuition for it is in finite dimensions, I write the modular operator like this where it's a product of a density matrix times something that commutes with all of the operators in the algebra. And then, you know, this piece just passes through in that conjugation there. And this is something in the algebra. So you're just conjugating by something in the algebra. And so that's how you see it in the type one and type two case. So if the density matrix factorizes, it's basically obvious. And then in the type three case, you have to do some work to prove it's true. Uh, another question from the chat. Um, someone is asking whether the modular flow is an outer automorphism in the type three case versus oh. being an automorphism in type one or two. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because I might have forgot to say that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So this this statement that you can factorize in type uh, one and two is the statement that this is an inner automorphism that just means it's generated by an operator, a unitary in the algebra. And the other important thing in related to the fact that you can't factorize is that this is now considered an outer automorphism. So there's no operator in the algebra that's generating this flow. So you really need to use the two-sided modular Hamiltonian when you're talking about these type three algebras when they come up in say quantum field theory. <clears throat> okay. So, um, yeah, the reason I wanted to introduce this is that these end up being the work, kind of the workhorse behind some of the stuff we'll do in later lectures where we talk about uh, constructions of 
algebras and entropies. You really will compute will compute these modular operators in these gravitational algebras and see the factorization happening. <laughs> okay, there's a second um, important generalization of this um, this uh, modular construction that involves relative modular operators. So. Okay, so instead of, uh, so the starting point is almost the same, but now we want to define an operator. Make sure I did, yeah. We're going to define the relative to meta operator in the same way, except now it changes the state on which the conjugation, the conjugate operator acts on. So for this, we'll take both states here, psi and phi, to be cyclic separating. Um, and uh, just a warning that the notation here is uh, apparently non-standard through the, the literature. So you just always have to remember, sometimes people write this in the opposite order. In particular, the Witten review that I cited earlier um, uses the opposite order for this. So it's something you have to keep in mind. I find this easy because this thing is next to this. So it's like you're eating the psi vector here and turning it into phi. So that's how I remember that. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so again, this is this is just called the relative to meta operator, and then it again has a decomposition, a polar decomposition into relative conjugation and a relative modular operator delta phi psi. And again, there's a mnemonic for this uh, relative operator, so delta phi psi. Again, you can say it's equal in quotation marks to the density matrix rho phi on the, the first factor times the density matrix for the psi state on the commutant factor inverse. And again, this, this order aligns up with which density matrices are which, so that's why it can be useful. And again, this factorization is true in the type one and two case. In the type three case, it's just a formal thing, and really you want to work with the full relative operator here. <clears throat> um, so again, the you can write log of delta phi psi um, is formally equal to minus h, uh, uh, sorry, minus log rho phi plus log rho psi. Um, and if you if you know something about quantum information, you might start seeing where we're going. Sorry, this is a prime. Um, because the, these operators eventually are useful for defining relative entropy. So before we do that, just a reminder, there's an analog of this equation in the relative case where it flips the operators and also changes the state as well. There's supposed to be an H on the equation you just wrote on the left hand side. Which which equation? The, the equation that you just wrote. I think not. Yeah. Yeah. Think this is, is yeah. It's kind of just take the log of this equation. Um, so if you're computing correlation functions in the state phi, you can reverse the operator in order and change the state using a relative uh, operator phi psi. Okay, and these, these types of statements are not too hard to show just from the standard definitions of the S and, you know, the, the fact that delta phi psi equals S phi psi dagger S phi psi. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so as I alluded to, the reason these relative operators are useful is that you can talk about a quantum information measure known as relative entropy in terms of them. <clears throat> so this is the relative entropy between two states. This is the Iraqi definition. Um, 
So you can define the relative entropy between the state phi and psi is equal to the expectation value of H psi phi. Okay. Phi minus log delta psi phi. So the expectation value, okay. So the order you have to define relative operators for both phi and psi um, kind of in the opposite direction as we defined it here. That's what this uh, relative modular operator is. Um, and so this gives a definition of relative entropy and it's nice because this is well-defined even in a continuum theory like quantum field theory. Um, <clears throat> so in particular, it holds for um, type three algebras. Um, so if you've heard the statement that relative entropies are well-defined in quantum field theory, it kind of comes from this. Um, and the other thing to mention about relative entropy is that it's usually used as a measure of distinguishability between the two states. So the larger the relative entropy is, the more distinguishable the two states are. And when the relative entropy is zero, that only happens when the two states are the same as states, you know, as states acting on your algebra A. So, you know, this, this definition is invariant if I act with unitaries from the computant. Yeah. Is this actually supposed to be phi and phi on both sides or yeah yeah you want to take the expectation in phi of this relative operator h psi of is, and so psi psi would give the same result no so the relative entropy is also is not symmetric if that's what you're asking but yeah <clears throat> okay and if just to to connect this with maybe a more familiar uh result you can use the fact that in the state phi, just the, the ordinary modular Hamiltonian has zero expectation value like this. Um, and then we can rewrite this relative entropy using this formal uh, uh, split into the two density matrices to get something that might be a bit more familiar. So you can write S rel by psi is equal to H psi by minus H phi. So here, this is just subtracting zero from this expression. And then we use the two splits of these in terms of the logs of the density matrices. So this is minus log row psi plus log row phi plus log uh, prime plus log row phi minus log row phi prime. Okay, so I just expanded out these two operators in terms of the density matrices. This is going to cancel this. And then if you say, um, so taking the expectation value in the state phi here of the remaining two operators, you can write this as trace, again, in the formal case, as row phi times, uh, yeah, log row phi minus log row psi. And this is like the usual uh, quantum info definition of the relative entropy. <clears throat> um, it also, okay, it also lets you view this as a sort of free energy. So if you think of with respect to the psi, uh, one-sided modular Hamiltonian, and so if you think of this as uh, a sort of energy k psi, and look at this expression. This is just minus the von Neumann entropy of the density matrix rho phi. So you can write this as, you know, minus s of rho phi plus expectation value of k psi in the state phi. <clears throat> so you can think of relative entropy as a sort of free energy defined with respect to this um, Hamiltonian here. How did you get the trace? I'm just saying taking expectation value in state phi is the same thing as doing trace row times oh, this. So okay. again, this is a bit formal, but just think of trace row of something as expectation value of that in state phi. Is that possibly a sign error? I mean, for some reason, I thought I remembered that relative entropy is minus 
Maybe I don't know. It's like, this needs to be minus an entropy. I know it's minus an entropy. So oh, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, and then there's some important properties that relative entropy satisfies. <laughs> so the first is that S rel is positive as a number. It's not obvious from this definition that this is true, but it follows from this inequality that minus log delta is greater than or equal to one minus delta. So if you use the relative delta psi phi and take the expectation value of this inequality in the state phi, you'll find that relative entropy is positive. So that's maybe, um, you can do that as an exercise and see how that works. I mentioned this already, but it's zero only if um, phi equals psi, okay, I'm going to put a star there, it equals as in terms of the, the states they define on the algebra A. So it really is, it's only if phi is equal to basically u prime acting on psi where u prime is a unitary from the commutant. So unitaries from the commutant don't change any sort of correlation functions in the original algebra. <clears throat> the third property, which is possibly what it's most important, is that it's monotonic under um, algebra inclusions. So if you restrict to subalgebras and compute the relative entropies of the states induced on the subalgebras, you'll find that the relative entropy tends to decrease as you restrict to subalgebras. Intuitively, what's happening is as you restrict to subalgebras, you have fewer things, fewer operators to measure, you know, detect how the states are different. And so the states become less distinguishable as you restrict to subalgebras. So this is, um, this is true in a lot of generality. You can prove this um, for a much broader class of transformations. So for generic quantum channels between um, between algebras or between states, um, the relative entropy is monotonic. And so it's a very powerful statement. Um, it's also sometimes known as the um, data processing inequality. Okay. So, I, okay. Yeah, maybe I'll pause now for any questions on relative entropy. Um, let's put you on in a second. This is a unitary, this is a unitary from the commutant. So it just doesn't do anything to correlation functions in the, the algebra. <laughs> Okay, um, the last thing that I'll just mention in words, uh, since we're a little behind on where I wanted to be, so I'll just mention this. Um, there's, sorry, there's an important uh, statement about what modular flows with respect to different states on the algebra, how they're related. Um, it's known as the, the co-cycle derivative theorem that modular flows between two states um, are related by inner automorphisms. And so if you have the statement is something like e to the i s h phi can be written as u of s e to the i s h psi u prime of s, where u is a unitary in the algebra. So this is unitary in A. This is a unitary in A prime. And so you say that the two different modular flows are related by inner automorphism. So they define the same outer automorphism on the algebra. Um, this is known as the, this is the result due to cons. Co-cycle derivative theorem, roughly. <laughs> and so this is something that will probably come up at some point, but 
it lets you say if you can say something about the modular flow on an algebra for one state, you automatically know certain properties about the modular flow in other states, and that they're very interrelated like this. <clears throat> Okay, so we're about to switch gears now. So hold on, before you yeah. raise this question. So relative entropy is not symmetric. Yeah. So the relative entropy is a state relative to another. Which one is the other in your notation is the question. I think I would say that it's the relative entropy of phi relative to psi, but yeah, I don't know. Um, you're, you're usually thinking of the second, this guy is the reference state that you're comparing to. Okay, but, the second yeah. entry. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, you, um, <clears throat> you can point to your free energy interpretation. Uh, yeah. Just say that, that it's the thermal state, so to speak, defined by psi. Yes, yeah, so you're taking, yeah, that's right. That's Sorry, right. the Hamiltonian defined by psi. Yeah, you're using to define the free energy. Yeah, and so psi is the, the thermal state relative to this. Yeah. And so you're defining free energies with respect to a reference equilibrium thermal state, which is psi. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to erase now. Okay, so it's time to switch gears, and we want to start talking now about um, how do you apply some of this formalism to quantum field theory? <clears throat> okay, so we're moving on to local algebras in quantum field theory. <clears throat> so kind of the overarching, where, where we're going is that um, you want to try to use some of the, the intuition we've developed or the, 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 well, just the formalism of algebras to understand operators defined in local subregions in quantum field theory. So in general, in quantum field theory, the operators you're always thinking about are operators that depend on a space-time point X. So X is a space-time point. And so one way to characterize a quantum field theory is that you can almost you can basically define a quantum field theory in terms of a, a fundamental set of fields and the, the vacuum correlation functions. So you can define some correlation functions one two to Xn as just the vacuum correlation functions of the operators by Xn inserted at those points. Okay, so these correlation functions are some distributional functions of the, the points. Um, and then you can start trying to write down various axioms that these correlation functions need to um, satisfy. So when you do, when you describe things like this, you call these correlation functions the Whiteman functions. There's various constraints that they need to satisfy related to things like causality, to the Lorentz invariance, um, to the fact, to positivity of the Hilbert space norm, et cetera. Um, another approach is that instead of working in space time, you can define a set of related functions in Euclidean signature. Um, these are, I think, sometimes called the Schwinger functions. If this is in Euclidean signature, and you think of obtaining the, the space time correlation functions via analytic continuation. So for the Whiteman functions, there's a set of Whiteman axioms that constrain these. Um, for the Euclidean picture, there's these Osterwalder Schrader axioms. Um, and that's one approach to uh, characterizing sort of a quantum field theory in, a, in some sense non-perturbative. You're just trying to write down the axioms that a generic quantum field theory needs to satisfy. So the algebraic approach is I guess probably it should be credited to Hogg and Kastler for developing this, the axioms for quantum field theory. Um, is, it's closely related, but somehow the focus is a bit different, is that you want to actually characterize the operator algebra itself as opposed to these correlation functions coming from uh, looking at fields that are smeared in local subregions. So the way it works is that you would write down a smeared field, you think of it as 
Okay, D4X will be in 4D for now, but um, uh, you just want to smear these fields at, from that are defined at space time points where the support of F will be in some subregion. So you will take some space time subregion, open subregion U, and you want F to be supported here. Okay, and so these are now a set of operators, um, and you want to characterize the full set of operators that you can get from choosing all, all kinds of smearings and using all kinds of fields in your algebra. So the idea is you want to take bounded functions. So think of something like e to the i s phi sub s, um, and this is just uh, so that we can work with an actual algebra of bounded operators. Um, and then you want to consider the weak closure of all such operators. And you would get that this would produce the von Neumann algebra associated with your subregion, A sub Q. What's the constraint of your apps? What sort of function is it to do? Oh, um, yeah, I don't know. There, there's probably certain smoothness relation requirements. I'm not sure exactly, but if it's not smooth enough, you might get uh, singularities in certain correlations. I don't know those probability distributions. No, it's just like telling you that I want to, you know, consider the field just restricted here. So I'm just like smearing it. Well, I don't know. It's just saying I want to consider the field smeared out here. You don't want to do the field at an actual space time point because these are a bit distributional, so it becomes problematic to multiply them. Yeah. So really the smearing is to avoid that. And then you say, okay, the set of all fields in this region you can get from choosing all of the possible smearings here. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering what characterizes the smearing. Is it like is F a smear F is a smearing function? So yeah, it's just a uh, function, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, there might be smoothness requirements, but uh, so I can't quote that off the top of my head for you. <laughs> was that easy grass at five? Just an example of a bounded, function? yeah. It's an, it's an example, yeah. I think, in terms of smearing, if I remember right, it can be enough to smear along a one dimensional set as long as it's time like, mm -hmm. but if it were as opposed to a four dimensional open set or something. But if it's space like, then uh, that's not enough. Right. Just co dimension one space like smearing wouldn't be adequate to make the operator well defined. Yeah. And there's there can be differences in that statement in free versus interacting theories as well. So, right. yeah. But generally, you just want to consider pulse. Okay. Make F at least be support, supported in an open region. I <laughs> Um. Conventionally, the treatment is just to require that F is smooth. If you want uh, sm smearings along um, uh, manifolds of lower dimension, like the lines that Professor Jacobson mentioned or space-like surfaces, you need uh, additional spectral properties. In and you also, in the space-like case, have to worry about things like the whether or not the theory is interacting. Uh, okay. Great. Okay, so just to mention the connection to the Whiteman approach, um, it should be kind of obvious, but essentially the, the connection is you just plug in these smearings into these. And so you would say like a vacuum correlation function by F1 by Fn can be written um, as an integral dx1 dxn. Okay of all the smearings, f of x1, f of xn, times these correlation, these Whiteman functions. <clears throat> so that's sort of morally the, the connection to the Whiteman functions um, okay. there. So it's just, it's almost just a change in perspective is that we just want to characterize the algebra that these operators are satisfying. Okay. Um, so, so we have two questions in the chat on the smearing functions. Okay. Uh, the first one is if the manifold, or I guess the set U, 
uh, contains multiple patches, whether the smearing function is uh, required to be supported in only a single patch? Um, no, I think you can write down things where it's supported in two different patches, just, yeah. Okay. And the second question is asking for a reference, uh, a rigorous reference, uh, treating um, these things carefully and explaining why you should be taking bounded functions. Um, yeah, probably the Hogg uh, book on local local quantum physics is the a good starting point, and then there's probably references there, so you can he'll describe the this picture, and maybe we'll direct you to to more rigorous treatments. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Um, so there's certain uh, features that you can derive from certain basic axioms that you impose on um, these correlation functions, things like positivity of the, the actual energy in Minkowski space, the global energy, things like that, they lead to, to certain holomorphic properties of these correlation functions. And one of the important things that you derive from this, it goes by the name of the riesz leader theorem. And what this says is that if you take um, you take this open set, some open set F for U in space time, consider the set of all uh, smeared operators of this form supported in that region, um, that the vectors that you obtain by acting with these local smeared uh, field operators on the vacuum is dense. This is enough to generate the whole Hilbert space, dense in the Hilbert space, H of the quantum field theory. <clears throat> um, so going off of what we just discussed on uh, in modular theory, this is the statement that the vacuum omega is cyclic uh, or the algebra A of U. Okay, so what is the relevance of this? So it says that this vacuum is a cyclic vector. And the reason I'm bringing this up is we're eventually gonna to wanna to do modular theory for the vacuum. And so it's satisfying uh, a property that it needs to satisfy that it talk about modular operators. On the other hand, this, when people first hear about it, it seems like a very strange thing because it says by acting with local operators um, in this, here, we need to avoid switching. So by acting with local operators in some open subregion, but localized in space-time, I can actually get any state, you know, and or sufficiently well approximate any state on the quantum field theory, in particular states that might have, you know, a whole bunch of stuff going on far away from the, the subregion. Um, so it sounds weird, but it's important to keep in mind that you know, if you're sitting in a lab and actually trying to, you know, create some operator far away by just acting with your local field operators, that's not going to work because in some sense, you're only really, you really only have access to unitary transformations um, when you yeah. manipulate things in a lab. Anything you do is you're just changing the Hamiltonian, you're implementing a unitary transformation. And the riesz leader theorem does not say that if you only act with unitaries, you get any state. So in some sense, it's important that you're acting with things that are not unitary to get any state in the Hilbert space. Um, so but isn't it, can I ask this for intuition's sake, yeah. <laughs> is it related to the fact that if you have a maximally entangled state of two qubits, like a Bell state, with a unitary on one of the qubits, you can turn it into any of the other. Well, not with a unitary. Bell states. On one of the qubits. A unitary yeah. on both qubits. Or, no, or no, 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 so you need, you so for qubits, there's an invariant that comes from acting with local unitaries, which yeah. is the entanglement spectrum. So probably for Bell states, they all have the same Entanglement eigenvalues, so right, it works. They do. But you can't change those entanglement eigenvalues. Oh, and this goes here. even beyond that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So the, that that statement is like weird in quantum field theory, so it's not exactly relevant. But it is a good idea to think of these cyclic states in terms of the the qubits as well. So instead of acting with unitaries, if you just act with arbitrary operators on your qubit, you will get 
you know, if you have one of these maximally entangled qubits to start with, you'll get any state uh, by just acting with non-unitary operators on one. Right. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> So maybe a related question to what Ted was asking. Um, what is the interpretation of this statement in terms of unitaries, in terms of what you can do with physical operations? What What is the range of what you can get by acting on the vacuum with locally supported unitaries? Okay. Um, maybe we should defer that if we, for later discussion. Uh, it's related to a result that I, I don't know the details of it, but there's a result by Combs and Stormer that says in the type three case, type three one case, you can do quite a bit by acting with the local unitaries, but you're not going to be able to, it's not going to be like you can approximate any state, but there's a lot of, there's a lot more you can do because there's not something, there's not a meaningful notion of this entanglement spectrum that I just mentioned in the type three one case. Um, but yeah, we can maybe discuss that later. Okay. <clears throat> Um, there's a second important thing just for gaining intuition for how you want to think about these local algebras um, that goes by the, the phrase hog duality. And this is sort of a, a statement both of uh, microcausality as well as sort of completeness of your algebra. Um, so again, if we have our little local region U, um, we can form what's known as the causal complement. Well, yeah, let me just go like this. So if you imagine kind of enclosing U with a light cone and then looking at the region that's space like separated from U. So this region over here, we'll write it as U prime. And this is the causal complement. A U so these are just all the points that are space like separated from everything here. Um, and then this diamond that's enclosing it here is sort of the causal completion. So it's the causal complement of the causal complement. Call that the causal completion. of you <clears throat> and hard duality is the property that the local algebra associated with an open subregion as a von Neumann algebra is actually equal to the von Neumann algebra for the full causal completion of that region. Um, Let's see. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. That is not hard duality. So this is just a statement that you expect um, U, the algebra generated by U, which is this little open subregion to coincide with the algebra of the causal completion. Hog duality is the statement that the algebra for the causal complement, which has been suggestively written as U prime, is equal to the commutant of your, your algebra here. Um, so it's the algebra of U, the, the subregion commutant. Yeah, sorry, there was a question. The underlines, what's the notation? Underlying, yeah, that's an emphasis. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. The, the red pen is also a notation. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so just to repeat. So the algebra, the algebra here, if you take its commutant, it's it kind of coincides with the causal complement of your subregion. So that's saying that you want, so it's microcausality because you want operators that are space-like separated to commute, but it's also some completion, completeness, that all of the operators that commute with it, with local operators here, are represented as something in this causal completion. <laughs> Hmm. Is that a, is that a topological restriction on space time at all? I mean, the oh. picture I'm looking at here is like Minkowski space, but yeah, what if there were holes or non-trivial topology in space time? I don't mean I don't. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, it might be a good discussion point. Um, okay. I think you can still do causal 
puzzle completions, but on yeah, when the, when you have poles, even in your subregions, and you have things like gauge fields and stuff like that, there are questions of whether hog duality. You have to check whether hog duality holds, and I think in some cases there it kind of doesn't hold, depending on the the spectrum of non-local operators in your theory. Um, yeah, there's been a lot. Off the top of my head, I know Cassini has been doing a lot of stuff recently with collaborators. Um, you know, Javier McGann and Pontello and some other people. Okay, the, so yeah, so there's some interesting topological questions, but for at least for these simple regions in Minkowski space, um, you expect hog duality to hold. <clears throat> Okay, and the, the point of bringing up hog duality is that um, because we the reach leader theorem says that the vacuum is cyclic for a subregion, cyclic for one algebra actually means that, that it is separating for the commutant. And essentially, you apply reach leader to the commutant, that means it's cyclic for the commutant region, so it means it's separating for the original region. Region. So all I'm saying is that reach leader plus hog duality means that the vacuum is both cyclic and separating for your subregion. That's just what we wanted to say for to apply modular theory. Okay, so yeah, now I'm trying to see if if uh, we have time to talk about the, the last thing here. Um, as we're okay, I'm kind of moving on to a new topic here. Um, but maybe I can describe quickly where we're going and build up a few, uh, yeah, just a few, maybe some notation for what we're going to be doing next. The, the goal um, for the next step is that we want to start computing the modular operators for subregions and but the actual thing that we want to do is the standard example um, we want to compute the modular operator for Rindler space so what I'll do is I'll start setting up just to remind people what Rindler space is and I might tell you the answer you might have you've probably heard this before but the topic that we're going to be talking about is known as the Vizag Nano Wickman theorem Um, and this is related to the fact that for Rindler wedges, the vacuum is sort of a thermal state. And we want to say it's thermal with respect to a particular Hamiltonian, and that's going to be the boost Hamiltonian. Okay. Okay, so what are we doing? We're working in Rindler space. So the Rindler wedge is the set of all points x mu, such that, that are space-like separated from a plane. So you want x zero squared plus x in the, the normal direction. This doesn't include, well, yeah, so x, we'll just let's call it x squared, right? Not greater than or equal to zero. So the picture is Rindler space. So this is x and t, or x zero. And we're looking at this region to the in the right wedge, and then in the transverse directions, it's just a, a plane. So the goal is that we want this is a, a open subregion U, which is this right Rindler wedge, um, and we want to compute the modular operator of the vacuum for this. Um, so the presentation we're going to use is the the path integral presentation. Um, and the goal is, okay, so we want to take the vacuum state, the Minkowski vacuum, and we want to compute the modular operator of the vacuum. <clears throat> and we're going to lead up, we're leading up to doing this with path integrals. When you're using path integrals, what you're actually doing is trying to compute the density matrices. So what you're trying to do is compute rho for the Rindler wedge um, times the, the density matrix for the the in the complementary wedge wedge inverse. So I said that this is a bit formal. So this to the extent that you can handle, there's going to be UV divergences in this density matrix. 
Um, but to the extent that you can make sense of that, in particular, if when you compute the individual guys and then combine them into a modular operator, um, it, you can argue that that kind of makes sense as a well-defined operator at the end of the day. So the density, the path integral representation of this um, ends up being um, a sort of quick way to do it that also is, it connects to a lot of standard ways people do um, work on like conformal field theory or just field theory in general. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, this is going to take a little time, so maybe I'll just conclude. So we're, we're going to, for next time, what we're going to be doing is looking at the path integral derivation. Of rho omega, and we're going to try to show that this is thermal with respect to the boost transformation. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, maybe I'll just stop there and then we can go to questions because, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, yeah, so if people have questions online, feel free to type or raise your hand. We can try to discuss. There are some. Yeah, there are a few in the Um, let's start with the first one here. Uh, Luca Ciambelli asks, "How is the vacuum state defined for the Riesz leader theorem to apply? Uh -huh. Is it any typical state?" Um, yeah, good question. Uh, the the vacuum state that we're talking about here is the Minkowski global vacuum. So, where the the Riesz leader theorem is about Minkowski space. You have time translations as a symmetry, and you're finding the lowest energy state for the time translation Hamiltonian. That is the state where the well, the Riesz leader theorem applies. Wait, um, but isn't it? Maybe that's the straightforward state you prove it for initially. But isn't it going to be true for any state that doesn't like differ infinitely in the UV from that state? Um, yeah, it might not because, yeah, depending on because the, the von Neumann algebras always have projections in them, and those are well defined operators, they're not like UV divergent operators. If you hit the vacuum with the projection, either from the subregion or the complement, it's not going to be cyclic separating anymore. So, yeah, maybe generic states are going to be cyclic and separating, but there's plenty of states that just aren't cyclic separating. Like what and they're not they're not weird states. What kind of projection do you have in mind? Uh well any projection. So there are projections in the von Neumann algebra. Um so something that squares to one. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's easy. They might they might be a bit weird to, to represent in terms of field operators. So I don't have that well, that's what I'm wondering if they thing. have like do you need infinitely high frequencies to represent I mean, these projections, though, are, are kind of better behaved than things like one-sided boosts. So there's there's singular operators that we work with in quantum field theory that are worse behaved than these projections is something I could say. Um, okay, I'll yeah. look it up. I know I've read somewhere that the class of states it applies to is very broad. And I intuitively... I mean, I think generically, it. most states were, will be... You know, fully entangled, but you can hit a state with a projection like that's allowed, and it's not. It's not singular <laughs> is the point. Um, so there are states where it's not that are not cyclic separating, and so you, yeah. Um, I should say that there are many projections that are easy to get in terms of the field operators. Namely, you just smear smear a field operator, and then you take a spectral projection. Oh, okay. uh, there's spectral projections. Yeah, those are just um, those are the yeah. They're they're a little schematic is the problem, but yeah, there are spectral projections of all operators. Right. Yeah. Some more questions here from the audience um, online. It, given a cyclic separating state for an algebra, mm -hmm. is there a direct computation of the corresponding modular operator without resorting to factorization of Hilbert spaces and using density matrices? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, thanks for the question, but I do want to emphasize what you do is you solve that relation that I wrote that um, this, you, this Tabita operator, you solve this relation that S A acting on your state psi equals A dagger on psi. 
Um, towards the end of the course, we're literally going to do this calculation for some of these gravitational algebras, and you'll see that there's no factorization assumption. You just find what this Tomita operator is, and you use that to get the density matrices for some type two algebra that you're working on. Mm -hmm. So there's no factorization. Uh, yeah, I, I should say go throughout the course, I'll be trying to do everything in terms of these well-defined things in the continuum, but I'll also be pointing to things like situations where you can pretend that it factorizes because sometimes it's easier to think about in that way. In particular, when we talk about generalized entropy, at the end of the day, the generalized entropy in quantum gravity is defined basically assuming a factorization. So we're going to write something down that's well-defined and then say, if you did a factorization, this is would coincide with generalized entropy. So mm. yeah, just to- We'll have to probe that we get to it. Another question, um, let's see, maybe I'll just read it. In quantum field, this is declared to be a naive question. We'll see if it is. Uh, in quantum field theory, it sounds like we're talking about algebras associated to space-time regions, mm -hmm. space-time regions, as opposed to spatial regions on a time slice, like yeah. entanglement entropy, uh -huh. but they act on definite states. What is they referring to? The algebras. The algebras yeah. yeah, should these space time regions always be causal diamonds? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, generally, you think of because of this discussion here in terms of cog duality and the, the fact that you associate things with the causal completion. So there's kind of a map between a, a region on a Cauchy surface. So if I take just a region on the Cauchy surface and I, okay. It's also not causal diamonds, but I have, I'm only able to draw in two dimensions for now. So it's going to look like a diamond, but in general, you could have some wiggly region on a Cauchy surface. You could start with this as your subregion. The causal completion of that is, you know, the full causal development of your Cauchy surface. So in general, if you assign algebras and entanglement entropies to causally complete regions in quantum field theory, and you just think of that as the everything you can right. influence by in general relativity lingo you call it the domain of dependence sure yes domain of dependence yeah of the set that's okay <laughs> there's another question somebody asked um at some point you said that sometimes modular hamiltonian is defined as just minus log rho yeah uh anticipating the next lecture is the bisnion wickman theorem valid if you define that modular Hamiltonian in this way? Um, so the bisignano wickman theorem will be that the modular, so in that case, it's that the modular operator is equal to the boost generator. And so remember a boost is something that evolves you forward in one slice, but then backwards in the other slice. When you do the one-sided version of that, that often shows up in physics, um, you're also talking about sort of, you're, you're saying, what is this one? And it's essentially the one-sided boost. So it's an operator that evolves you forward here um, and it fixes everything here. And because it kind of generates a kink right here, that's somehow related to the fact that this is a bit singular. Um, so bisignano wickman is just determining the two-sided operator that generates the full boost. Yeah. I think that answered the question, but if the asker does not satisfy, you can follow up. I have a question. Okay. Yeah. This might be completely unrelated, but can you think of renormalization in this one normal algebra language? Renormalization. Yeah. Um, can you repeat the yes. question? Because it might not have been possible. Oh, okay. Yeah, the question was can you think of renormalization in terms of unknown algebras? Um, yeah, you probably can. Um probably the way what you want to do is that um renormalization usually deals with some sort of how your theory depends on a, a regulator, or you could phrase it as how uh, things depend on a regulator. There's there could be a way to phrase that in terms of like channels on your algebras um, from like a quantum information perspective. So you can think of regulators as ways of approximating your algebras with finite dimensional, say, algebras or just other algebras that have been coarse grained in a certain sense. Um, I'm sure there's people who have done stuff related to that. Um, there's, there's recent work specifically about that. 
Am I going to remember the name of the guy? So I thought it's possible Nima Lashkari was doing stuff on this. I don't remember. It's a student but... at Caltech. Okay. It's a French name. Okay. Oh, Elliot. Elliot. Elliot okay. Castell. Oh, okay. I didn't know Elliot was okay. I think he has a paper on formalizing the idea of a normalization group in terms of like nested sequence of algebras and subalgebras. Mm -hmm. So defining the uh okay in in, in gravity though so, uh was it he had one on generalized entropy also thinking about that well he implemented it in the holography context yeah but i think he was proposing it as a general framework also for normalization okay yeah Great, are there? Let me just see. Okay. Um, I think somebody earlier asked if high duality holds for gauge theories when they're on the biggest numbers. And then, oh, yeah, I mentioned they... that it's possibly, yeah, question about high duality for gauge theory. Um, I think there's, there's situations where it might not hold, and there can be ambiguities in general in defining the local algebras. Precisely due to non local operators like Wilson loops and things like that. Yeah. Um, yes, I have uh, two questions. Um, okay. the, f the first one regards uh, the um, Con Stormer theorem that you brought up earlier. Okay. So, could you say a little bit more, if if there's time in the discussion, about the uh, about what states you can get with unitaries? Uh, yeah, I, we probably need to do that offline actually, because I I'm try I'm trying to remember. I just I remember the cone stormer is something that you can transform. It has something to be being like completely opposite of this thing where there's an entanglement spectrum in finite dimensions. Um. And I, yeah, I forget the exact statement, but I, I have to look that up. So, uh, it, but yeah, it's related to what you can do by acting with unitaries in the local algebra. Um, yeah, so it, we'll have to do that offline. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> the other thing was probably a quick clarification regarding the the other the properties of the that you're assuming for the local nets of algebras. Uh, you haven't said this ex explicitly, uh, but it follows from what you said that the uh, algebras are nested in th that they satisfy isotony in that um, okay. subregions okay. haven't uh, the the algebra for a subregion embeds into the algebra for the larger region. But are you uh -huh. also going to assume additivity in that um, if you have algebras of two of two uh, distinct regions, that the algebra of the combined region is the is the like the algebra gener generated by the union? Right. Um... I don't think it'll come up in these lectures. I, I think that's also a property in standard quantum field theory. Um, Might fail in gauge theories. In gauge theories. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, gauge theories. And there's also, you know, there's interesting ways to violate that as well. So a lot of, I mean, it's some some things that people have been doing recently on large n algebras and uh, in quantum field theory, um, and, well, sorry, in, in holography. Um, they use uh, generalized free fields on the boundary, and those are also something where this additivity doesn't really hold. So there's sort right, of okay. interesting uh, pathological pathological example, well, somewhat pathological that can violate certain axioms that you thought should just be true. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks. Wait, we have uh, new, new questions popped up. And are you going to sketch the proof of why local algebras in QFT is type three? We're going to uh, discuss it. Uh, we're not going to really <laughs> sketch a proof, but we're going to discuss intuitively why it's true. Okay. Uh, <laughs> somebody would ask, um, could you remind us what entanglement spectrum means? Oh, by that, I mean, like, if you have a dense, so what the question was, what is entanglement spectrum? There, I just mean the eigenvalues of the density matrix. So if you have a density matrix, you diagonalize it, and you know, it's the those eigenvalues of the density matrix. So the collection of probabilities. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Anybody here? Nobody else online? Okay. Call it a day. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone.